right, guys. Uh, I am Anil Vadgule. I work uh, in company named Equal Experts, uh, which is in Pune, India. And uh, I'm going to talk about solid design principles in 2D. So, so this talk is about uh, uh, design principles, which I uh, realize help me to improve my code and uh, ultimately uh, write good object-oriented code, which is uh, extensible and uh, uh, like uh, reusable. So uh, all of us are software developers. So initially when we write uh, our code, uh, our application, uh, it is all good. Uh, version 1.0 uh, is uh, very good. There are no issues. But after uh, some time, uh, your application becomes like this. Because of changes, uh, you keep changing your code, you keep modifying your code uh, because of uh, client request, and uh, that makes your code uh, bad. So your application will change, and it will become messy, and developers will hate to work on it. It's very, uh, it will become very uh, un, uh, difficult to actually go and add features. Uh, mostly I have seen this happening in most of the projects. So why that happened? It happened because of bad design. So if your application doesn't have good design, if uh, it doesn't have uh, uh, like good object-oriented code, it will be very difficult to add uh, uh, like new features to it. So after time, uh, it become bad. So writing model code doesn't mean uh, writing good design. So uh, most of the uh, Ruby programmer uh, actually follow Ruby Adams, uh, some of the uh, like modularity concepts. So just because you uh, follow dry or uh, TD uh, doesn't mean uh, uh, you are following good design. So good design is about uh, managing dependencies. Uh, Ruby is object-oriented programming language. So everything is object in Ruby. So whatever you write, are nothing but objects, and how those objects are interacting with each other, uh, that makes a good design, and uh, that will make your code extensible and uh, like uh, ready for change. So these are uh, like this, in this diagram, A is dependent on X, Y, Z. So X, Y, Z uh, depend on M. Uh, S is subclass of T. So all these are dependencies, and if you don't manage these dependencies well in your application, it is going to uh, hurt in future. So unmanaged managed dependencies are killing your application, and a good design might save you. So what are smells of bad design? First is rigid. Rigid means your application is difficult to change. Uh, one change is causing too many uh, other changes in your system. So if that's the case, it's rigid. Uh, second is fragile. Fragile means uh, your application is easily breakable. Uh, so if you uh, change one part, like if you change controller and suddenly worker is breaking, so something is uh, like messed up. So that's fragile design. Uh, immobile. So whatever you write should be reusable. If you are writing code which is not reusable, then it's not of any use. So uh, if your code is hopelessly entangled with each other, that makes your application immobile. And viscous. So viscous means uh, you probably have followed good design, uh, but uh, uh, it's very easy to add hacks than actually follow good design. If that's the case, then uh, that means your ap application uh, is viscous. So initially, uh, it was good. So like whenever we write application for the first time, it was good. But after many changes, after uh, like new changes, new requirements, uh, it becomes bad. And that's a pattern, actually that happens many times. So changes killed it. So software development is not a game of Jenga, right? We don't keep adding features. So if you keep adding features uh, without actually thinking about design, uh, it will work for uh, like some time, but after some time it will become uh, very difficult to manage that application. And in enterprise world, uh, this is a pretty common pattern. So, so why solid? So solid uh, helps us to write loosely coupled, highly cohesive, easily composable, context independent, uh, reusable, uh, easily testable code. So ultimately it makes your code easy to maintain and extend over time. 
So uh, Robert R. Martin, uh, who is famous as Uncle Bob, has written this uh, paper in early 2000s, uh, Design Principles and Design Patterns, which mentions about these principles. And also uh, Michael Feathers uh, coined this uh, term, uh, solid. So S means single responsibility, O means open close principle, L means Liska substitution principle, I means interface segregation principle, D means dependency inversion principle. Let's look at these principles in detail. Uh, first is single responsibility. So this principle says a class should have a, s a single purpose. Class should serve a single purpose. There should not be more than one reason for a class to change. If there are multiple uh, like behaviors that you have uh, wrapped in a class, that means it's not single responsible. Uh, the ways of achieving this principle are uh, revealing intent. Uh, like find out what is the intent of your code. Uh, rename, rename the variables, rename the uh, method names, rename the con uh, introduce constants, and extract methods into other methods, uh, extract uh, behavior to other classes, extract methods to other classes. Uh, if you do that, uh, it will make your, uh, like, uh, it will introduce new classes and that will have single responsibility. So, uh, following so a single responsibility code uh, generates highly cohesive co uh, code and removes immobility smell. So let's say our client asks us to implement feed server application. So let's see how we can uh, apply few, uh, single responsive principle there. So a developer could go and uh, write uh, like these methods. So feed server application basically fetches feed from a feed URL, parses that feed, and saves the feed to database. So one class can actually have these three methods. A normal developer could go and write code like this. This will work. But this class is not following single responsive principle. So to achieve single responsive principle, uh, we could refactor like this. So we could extract methods into different uh, classes, uh, which are single responsible. So feed feature will fetch feed. Uh, RSS parcel will uh, parse the RSS feed and feed server will um, save the feed. So if you do that, uh, we can reuse these uh, classes from other parts of your code and uh, your code will become cohesive and also uh, immobility smell will go away. So this is how we achieve single responsive principle. Okay. So next principle is uh, open close principle. As you see in this image, to wear a coat, you don't have to do heart surgery. So the principle says the same. Uh, software entities, classes, module, methods should be open for extension but closed for modification. Uh, is it practically possible to write such code which is open for extension but practically, uh, sorry, closed for mo modification? Yes, it can be achieved using open close principle. Let's see how. It can be achieved using inheritance and composition. Uh, and uh, if your code has lots of if else cases or long switch cases, that means uh, there is a chance to introduce this principle. Let's see example for this. So uh, now clients want to uh, like introduce uh, atom parsing. So previously used to it used to do RSS parsing, now uh, it is also parsing RSS. So it is uh, like a developer could go and add if else case and uh, just delegate the atom parsing to atom parser. But this uh, save feed has now if else case and that is changing behavior. So tomorrow if our client wants another type of feed to be parsed, uh, he has to go and modify this code. So this method is not open for extension and also not closed for more. Uh, uh, modification. So to achieve open close principle, uh, what we could do is that so uh, so we could uh, abstract this uh, behavior uh, of if else case. We could introduce a parser abstraction 
in that parser abstraction we could uh, just uh, in ruby we don't have to add that parser class because uh, ruby is duct type but uh, uh, now we have rss parser and uh, atom parser and we can just uh, call this uh, like we can just pass this uh, parser to the our uh, save feed class so now our uh, method is open for extension and close for modification we can uh, just add another type of parser if required and pass it to the save feed and uh, that way uh, we can achieve open close principle. Basically you have to uh, like if there is branching uh, you have to replace that with delegation. Uh, you have to uh, inject changing behavior. Uh, don't have changing behavior in your class. Uh, just inject that from outside and uh, wrap behavior with abstraction. So uh, if there is, uh, if you're, uh, if there are different types of APIs for the dependencies, you could uh, actually wrap that dependencies into a one abstraction and then pass that dependency uh, to the uh, user of that uh, dependency. So that's how we achieve open close principle. So we saw uh, the code example. And this is how we achieve abstraction, uh, abstraction with parser and uh, followed open close principle. Okay, let's see next principle which is Liskow substitution principle. As this image shows, uh, if it looks like duck, quacks like duck, but needs batteries, it might be a pro uh, wrong abstraction. So this is a very uh, different principle actually. Uh, this was uh, written by uh, Liskow Barbara. And uh, there is a rule for this principle. Uh, firstly, subtype must be substitutable for their base types. And uh, this rule is uh, like, that, like this. Let q of x be a property provable about objects x of type t. Then q of y should be true for objects y of type s, where s is subtype of t. Basically, uh, subclasses should not uh, modify behavior of their parent class. This line also tells uh, more about this principle. If a piece of client code works for a type, then it must f work for all derived or variant types. A new type, uh, new subtype should not screw up client code. Uh, rules implement inheritance based on uh, behavior. Uh, do not vo violate uh, uh, behavior of your parent class. Do not do less than your parent class. Uh, it's okay to uh, extend behavior, but it's not okay to actually. Uh, stop the behavior of your parent class. And also, uh, Liska uh, Barara mentions about uh, pre and post conditions rule. We'll see uh, what are those. So, instead of our RSS parser example, uh, we will take this classical example uh, for Liska's uh, substitution principle. Uh, suppose our application using uh, uh, instances of this rectangle class. So rectangle has width and height and uh, rectangle also has method called area. So this is working fine. Uh, it's uh, like there are thousands of instances of rectangle in your application and now uh, suddenly our client says uh, I want to introduce a square. So a developer could think a square is perfect rectangle and he could uh, introduce square like this where he could just override uh, uh, like he could just pass side and uh, instead of uh, uh, width and height because square doesn't have width and height and square is perfect rectangle. So he, uh, he just changes initialize method to pass side and this could uh, work fine but uh, there is a high chance that some other developer could override this uh, height method and uh, if you see right uh, square is uh, square will return area as 100 uh, normally but if somebody overrides this height it will uh, return 300. So th that's uh, that's breaking Liskov substitution principle. So you should follow Liskov substitution principle for better uh, code. Uh, let's see what are pre and post conditions. Uh, uh, here we will take example of base calculator. Uh, base calculator actually calculates uh, past input. Uh, the behavior of base class is that uh, it. Uh, the input should be greater than zero and uh, less than 20. So uh, a valid uh, subclass uh, can actually 
so the rule is preconditions cannot be strengthened in a subclass. So uh, a valid subclass can actually uh, weaken the preconditions, but it cannot uh, strengthen precondition. So let's see another subclass. So here you can see uh, this is weakening precondition that's allowed. But if it starts uh, strengthening preconditions, it's breaking list cost substitution principle. So whenever you write subclasses, you should uh, take care that you are actually uh, not strengthening uh, the preconditions. So that's how we achieve precondition rule. Uh, means not by not breaking the. Uh, So by not, not breaking the behavior of parent class. Uh, so this rule is about post conditions. Uh, it says that post conditions cannot be weakened in subclass. So uh, we have best calculator. The contact is it will always return positive numbers. So currently a base class is returning positive numbers. But uh, if you write a subclass which will start returning uh, any kind of number which is passed. Suppose if you pass a negative number, if you start returning that, it, the, you are breaking con contract and you are weakening your post conditions. So if that's the case, uh, it means that uh, you are breaking list cost substitution principle. So so I exp I gave these classic examples because mm, in normal uh, way, uh, this principle is hard to explain uh, in regular application. But if you follow these rules, uh, it is easy to uh, follow. Uh, Follow list cost substitution principle. Okay, so next principle is uh, interface segregation principle. Uh, like there is a USB port, uh, there are USB port, and uh, there is a USB. Uh, so this principle says that. Many client specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. So it's better to have a client specific interface, uh, separate client specific uh, class. So in Ruby, we don't have interface. We have modules and classes. So we can say that many client specific modules are better than one general purpose model or class. Uh, client should not be forced to depend on uh, methods that they do not use. So. Uh, so following this principle helps us to write highly cohesive and uh, it highly cohesive code and removes immobility smell. Let's see uh, uh, like two examples uh, which will convey this principle. So we have uh, a common model TV which has on, off, select channel, up, down, record and play methods. And we have uh, the HDTV and normal TV. So HDTV includes this TV model uh, which is fine and normal TV includes this uh, TV model. But normal TV doesn't need record and play methods. So what we could do is that we could override these methods and say uh, okay those, those are disabled. Uh, so like this works but uh, it's breaking interface segregation principle. So you should segregate your methods into two different uh, modules actually. Instead of common uh, TV module you could add a module named DVR and a module named TV. So DVR module will have record and play methods and uh, TV module will have other methods uh, other than record and play which are common and uh, HDTV module will include this uh, HDTV class will include these two modules and uh, normal TV class will include just TV module. So that's how we achieve uh, interface segregation with modules. Uh, let's see another example where uh, it's with classes. So let's say we have a class called car. Car has the th these three methods open door, start car, change engine. Uh, driver is making use of only two methods open door and start car. And mechanical mechanic will use uh, change engine. So the same uh, object of the class is shared between two different uh, clients. So instead of uh, right, so this is breaking interface segregation principle. So you should have two different classes like this.
Uh, now, a driver is making use of car object, which is fine because car object now has only two methods which uh, a driver will use. And mechanic doesn't need this car object. Uh, it can have separate class, which, it, uh, which is uh, car internals, and that has this change engine method. So uh, this rule is lit like seems okay. Why sh we should do this? But uh, this actually makes your code highly cohesive and uh, immobile and uh, extensible for the future. Uh, okay, next principle, which is last principle, which is dependency inversion. So as the image shows, instead of uh, connecting wire directly, we, we are using switch and that plug. The principle says, depend on abstraction, do not depend on concretions. Uh, there is uh, another definition of this principle, which is more uh, theoretic. Uh, high level models should not depend on uh, low level models. Both should depend on abstractions. Ab abstraction should not depend on details. Uh, details should depend on ab abstractions. Uh, like this seems very difficult to understand, but let's see how this is achieved with uh, a classic example. So let's say uh, there is a program which is copier. Uh, which is reading from keyboard and writing to printer. So, a copier program could be written like this. Let's see how. Uh, which has now hard-coded dependencies, keyboard and printer. So, this works, but uh, to follow dependency inversion principle, uh, so, uh, the name of the principle is dependency inversion, right? So, how to invert dependencies? Currently, uh, dependency direction is on down, downwards direction. So, uh, to revert dependencies, uh, so, uh, like, tomorrow if you want to use disk instead of printer, um, it's impossible with this because you have to change the code. So we can achieve that with this uh, dependence, uh, like inverted dependencies. Uh, we could uh, introduce abstraction uh, copier should depend on these two abstractions, which, which is uh, first is reader abstraction, second is writer abstraction. Uh, and as the uh, principle uh, says, high level models should not depend on low, low level models, both should depend on abstractions. So you can see both are now depending on these uh, two abstractions, uh, reader abstraction, writer abstraction. And ab abstraction should not depend on details, details should depend on abstractions. So that is also achieved. So uh, this is how we invert dependencies. and. Uh, uh, like a common, uh, like we can implement this using dependency injection, a common pattern to do that. But this can be very uh, like abstract. Uh, like you can have common contact, which is uh, common abstraction uh, in like REST services. We write contract, right? So we are not dependent on actual implementation. We uh, mostly have contracts there. So uh, this is. Uh, pretty abstract uh, uh, like uh, principle, but if you follow this principle, you again make your code uh, very clean and uh, easy to explain. So uh, let's see that same example where uh, now this code shows it has used these abstractions. Uh, and tomorrow we can change printer to disk. So common smells of this uh, principle are a new keyword. If you see new keyword in your code, it means that there is a chance you can uh, do uh, like dependency inversion. And directly static or class method calls. If you have that, uh, that, that also is breaking this principle. So what uh, what does applying solid principles uh, lead? It it converts your rigid, fragile, and scary code to uh, flexible, robust, and cuddly code. And uh, I recently came across this tweet, which says you cannot teach software design, but uh, this is wrong. Uh, actually, by learning these principles, uh, I have one example to share. So in my company, uh, five recent graduates ha uh, had joined, and uh, they were writing, uh, they were solving some problems. 
uh, using object oriented uh, code but their code was not good enough uh, since they since the day they learn about these solid principles they the code they wrote they follow tried to follow these principles it, it is not always possible to apply all f five principles but if you follow at least four principles your code is good enough uh, to go to production uh, and uh, ultimately it becomes extensible and uh, reusable so uh, so uh, tdd is not enough like doing tdd uh, people say uh, it helps to your design but uh, it not it does not and dry is also not enough if you just follow dry it's not that you are writing uh, it's it might be like just model code but it's not about design so design because you expect your application to succeed because uh, whatever we write today uh, if it succeeds we have to change the code and if your change is not ready uh, for uh, if your code is not ready for change then you have problems also uh, if it is having bad design it is also bad for the feature of the application so so do design and design patterns so design patterns are reusable solutions to commonly occurring problems uh, so uh, like uh, if you follow design patterns blindly it's a problem but if you follow design principles blindly i think it will definitely help so i used to uh, like I, I i read about design patterns a long time back and i used to apply design patterns but it was uh, complicating my code but Following design principles never complicated my code. It actually helped to uh, write code with better design. So finally, uh, as in the last uh, yesterday's talk about, uh, by Konstantin, abstraction is the key. You have to abstract things. In all the principles, uh, somewhere there, abstraction is there. Uh, and uh, if you abstract uh, the things out, it will automatically follow these principles. So do follow solid principles. Thank you. I do recommend reading this book by Sandy Metz. Uh, my talk is inspired from her talk. So, and also uh, Thoughtbot has this weekly iteration. Like Ben uh, Ornstein has this, uh, discussed about these uh, principles in detail. And uh, uh, Uncle Bob has this site called Clean Coders where he also discusses about these principles. So as a Ruby programmer, we mm, always believe in duct typing and all the things. But I think if you are working as an application developer for a big application, if you follow these uh, principles, uh, it will help your future. Uh, it will ma make you a happy developer. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so we're running a little bit short on time, uh, but uh, maybe you can take one question. Thank, thanks for your talk, Neil. Uh, all these principles sound great. Uh, my question is, which one of these principles do I need to apply to prove that rainbows are real? <laughs> all the principles. <laughs> all of them, OK. <laughs> so thanks, Neil, again. OK, thanks.